So, um, yeah, as you can tell by the title of my talk, this talk is about uh, GPU-based techniques for visualizing uh, astrophysical simulation data. And uh, there seems to be an unspoken rule that, that talks about GPUs have to show you a slide like this, so I wanted to get it out of the way and impress you by this uh, incredible uh, performance numbers these devices get nowadays, but um, it's, it's no secret that the raw performance numbers don't tell you too much about how your algorithm will perform on devices like that. It's much more the memory access patterns, things like that. But there are many application areas where GPU really gives you good performance, good performance boost, and one of these areas is definitely computer graphics because simply these cards are designed for this task. They're designed for rasterization-based graphics. Um, so what is rasterization-based graphics? Let's, let's for a minute assume that you want to visualize this triangulated model here. Beautiful dolphin model I found on Wikipedia. Um, Rasterization-based graphics generates the image by projecting this model triangle by triangle into the uh, image plane. So this is usually described by the so-called rasterization pipeline for visualization. So you first have to define your in input mesh, your connectivity, the vertices, the positions of the vertices of the mesh. Um, transfer that all to the GPU. And then the GPU will assemble the triangles built on the kind of connectivity information you provided and break up the triangles into uh, pixels that correspond to pixels that are covered by the triangle on the screen. This is the rasterization step. This is what, what coins the name of the whole pipeline. Then the pixels are color coded based on additional information stored on the vertices of the grid, the mesh, and then um, these color-coded pixels are combined with pixels already in the frame buffer, and once all the pixels are processed, the final image is displayed. So this is the pipeline as it was like end of the 90s, when uh, FGI was still doing computer graphics. But then um, there was a growing demand for more flexibility in this pipeline. So computer graphics, community, game developers require to influence the way this stream of input triangles is processed in this, in, in this hardware. So the um, hardware vendors, um, added programmability in forms of so-called graphics shaders. There's different types of graphic shaders. Uh, there's vertex shaders that uh, run on each vertex that is given in the input mesh. So they run in a massively parallel fashion, one for each uh, of the input vertices. And then you can do things like change the color associated with the vertices, change their position, uh, things like that. There is another type of shader, uh, so-called geometry of simulation shader, that allow you to, to add rendering primitives to this pipeline or um, discard them. It comes in very handy sometimes. And uh, last but not least, fragment changes which allow you to flexibly uh, modify the way the, the pixels rasterized from the triangles are uh, color coded and, and combined with pixels already in the frame buffer. And then there's a lot of hardware units uh, supported on this graphics cards that speed up tasks in this pipeline, like things for a trilinear interpolation of uniform data blocks, some texture units, rasterization, pixel blending operation, visibility testing. A lot of these are not available in CUDA or OpenCL. So you have to use rasterization-based APIs like OpenGL or DirectX to uh, use this uh, hardware features. And then there's, of course, massive parallelism in this pipeline. Um, you can process all the triangles and pixels in parallel. This is why these graphics cards are massively parallel architectures that can uh, launch thousands of threads and, and operate massively parallel on this uh, input uh, stream of data. And so uh, I'd like to show you a little sequence that was um, generated using rasterization-based graphics. It's um, one of the scenes we produced in cooperation with the um, Hayden Planetarium with Carl Emmel's uh, group at, at uh, the Hayden Planetarium in New York. And uh, I'd like to first show you the movie. It's narrated by Neil deGrasse Tyson, and then talk a little bit about how we rendered this uh, scene. And I hope we're going to have sound. I don't want to miss. Okay. I think the movie's just not playing yet. Ah, here we go. Okay. The universe contains clusters of galaxies, like this one. Each cluster, home to trillions of stars, 
generates enough gravity to warp the space around it into a giant lens that distorts our view of the galaxies beyond. But when we calculate the strength of these gravitational lenses, we find that each cluster must contain six times more matter than we can see there. So now it seems that all the glowing stars are just the glittering froth on a dark cosmic ocean of invisible stuff called dark matter. The motions of galaxies within each cluster confirm the presence of dark matter. The galaxies orbit too fast to be held together by the gravity of normal matter alone. Remove the dark matter, its lensing stops, and the cluster flies apart. Okay, so uh, how did we do it? So actually the scene was rendered in three different layers. Um, the large scale structure, the distribution of the galaxies in the background was uh, given by the positions of uh, halos extracted from the millenni Millennium XXL run. Then uh, Raul Angulo was uh, so nice to give us the halo positions and then we placed uh, two dimensional galaxy images on, at these positions. And then the lensing of that uh, background image Background images was um, computed in a fragment shader like the one I just described on the slides earlier that operates on the pixels of the image and then computes the distortion assuming that uh, the cluster profile is, is uh, reasonably well as um, approximated by an NFW profile. And this is really what these fragment shaders are made for. This slice is totally interactive nowadays because you just read pixel data once, do a lot of computation, write it out again. It's really flying on these, on these um, graphics cars nowadays. You can't show that movie? I mean, this is just the scene from, from a larger uh, show, right? So. And I guess he wouldn't even have the license to show it, so you might. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, right, so the lensing was done on the fragment shader. And then the foreground galaxies, uh, we stole these from an uh, ANSO simulation run by Jihoon Kim. So the foreground galaxies were actually three dimensional galaxy models consisting of about 10,000 to 100,000 star particles used in ANSO. So we um, applied a Halo Finder to uh, the simulation that was used for this visualization here to extract the most beautiful uh, of the galaxies that Jihun created here and then stitched them together to form the, the foreground cluster and then added the dynamics and took the freedom to, to blow that thing apart at the end. It's pretty dark here. Is it possible to turn the light, lights even lower? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Oh yeah, that's, that's much better. <laughs> now you see the galaxies. Okay. Okay, so for, for this scene, we uh, created quite a, a lot of, of uh, image data. So each scene was rendered about 100 megapixel resolution, and then they generated about a terabyte of image data at the end. So that's a large amount of tera of, of image data I rendered for the sequence so far. Um, so and now I'd like to talk about how to use rasterization-based graphics to visualize n-body dark matter simulations, n-body dark matter simulation data. And I I'd like to concentrate on density projections along the line of sight. So uh, simply, uh, it's, it's the yeah, most popular uh, visualization method for, for dark matter simulation, I'd say. So you simply integrate the density or powers of the density along the line of sight and display the results in the image plane probably stretching it a bit and, and, and enhance the, the contrast. And of course you need some kind of density, dark matter density estimator in order to get a smooth density distribution in between tracer particles. And the standard way that it's done 
uh, are kernel smoothing techniques for some SDH uh, methods, like you select the, find the nearest n neighbors, compute the, the sphere that encloses them, and then uh, get an estimate for the density around the tracer particle and maybe smooth that out using a Gaussian or a Felix Klein kernel. Um, so this is, for example, what we did for, for this visualization, a simulation run by Risa Wexler that shows the formation of a massive uh, cluster of galaxies, about a thousand halos here, that form in this region. And you see that the representation of the dark matter density is, up, is pretty good, like in the, in the halo part where there's a lot of, of dark matter tracer particles, but the density is pretty high. But in the filaments and the voids, the, the um, image quality is, is pretty noisy because you're really assuming that the dark matter peaks at the positions of the tracer particles because the kernels have like local maxima there. So uh, typical artifacts are too much smoothing where you washed out these caustic structures here you see in this inlet. Then uh, noise in the low density regions where the kernel sizes are not large enough to give you a smooth representation of the dark matter. And then in, uh, a while ago Tom came up with this uh, great idea of instead of working with the tracer particles directly, just use them to define uh, cells in phase space and spread out the mass throughout these cells to get a better density estimate. I'm sure he talked about that in the session tomorrow, so uh, this morning, so probably can go over that quickly. I just want to recap the, the basic ideas. So um, let's assume we are at the initial time step. This is a two-dimensional phase space diagram, so the traces are laid out on the uh, horizontal axis and uh, adjacent pairs of tracer particles uh, define cells in phase space. And then the n-body code goes on, and, um, goes on and deforms these cells. So the tracer particles are new, moved and uh, would change the, the um, positions of the tracer particles plus the, the volume of the cells we define. So this, two line, uh, this line segments here in the phase space diagram. But since we um, initially know the amount of mass per cell, and we recompute the density of the, the uh, volumes of these uh, phase space elements, we can get an estimate for the uh, density of each cell. So in order to get an estimate of the density at each position, in position space, we simply have to project down all the cells that uh, cover this position. So in that part here would be one stream of dark matter plus one cell needed for each position. In the central part, where a shell crossing occurred, it would be three um, streams, coexisting streams of dark matter on the right hand side would be one stream of dark matter again. So using two uh, spatial dimensions, the whole thing looks like that. So we start with this regular grid layout, like quad elements, which are then distorted due to the motion of the tracer elements until they partially overlap at later time steps, showing the formation of, of structure. So in principle, one could work directly with these um, cubes in 3D but uh, that gets kind of hard to compute the, the volumes which are needed to get a density estimate. So it's better to first split up the cells into uh, tetrahedral elements between, uh, because they always stay convex no matter how the particles move, how the tracer particles are advected. Um, and and um, tetrahedral elements are defined by triangles. I talked about like how good rasterization-based graphics is at crunching large amounts of triangles, so let's use that type of graphic hardware to do the rendering job, to, do, to compute the density projections along the line of sight. But there's a problem with that, like this approach produces a lot of tetrahedral elements, right? So even a moderately resolved dark matter simulation, five plus cubes, tracer particles, results in almost a billion tetrahedral elements because you generate six tetrahedral per te uh, tracer particle. And that comes with pretty uh, high memory requirements. So, um, a run like that would be 1.5 gigabytes for the positions alone, then another three gigabytes for the densities, plus six, uh, 17 gigabytes for, for the connectivity information because you have to tell the graphics hardware how to, how to connect the uh, tracer particles to form the triangles and the tetrahedral elements. So that's more than nowadays graphic cards uh, offer, so we would have to split it up and render it in several passes and that would slow down the rendering performance a lot. So we came up with a, um, a rendering approach for this type of input data that's like tailored for this rasterization based graphics that gets rid of uh, all the connectivity information and the uh, density computation on the CPU. 
You don't have to transfer that information from the CPU to the GPU, just compute it on the fly in the GPU. All you have to do is to transfer the raw position data to the GPU. So you store that in a three-dimensional texture, then call a vertex shader for each cell in this texture, where we sample the vertices that define the positions of the tracer particles at a certain time step, and then hand that information over to a geometry shader where we can actually add triangles to the to the stream. So we can generate the paths in the geometry shader, compute the densities based on the volume, and give that information to a fragment shader that would actually do the ray casting to, to sum up the intensities along the line of sight. So we basically got rid of these two memory components and just have the 1.5 gigabytes for the positions in this case. If this is, uh, if the position data is even larger than GPU memory, it's easy to split up the uh, texture into smaller bricks, render them separately, either sequentially on one node or distribute that on a cluster, render it in parallel, and then composite the results. Pretty straight, straightforward. And uh, here's some rendering results. Uh, SVH current smoothing on the left, showing this uh, yeah, quite washed out structure of the caustics. And the same data set using this self protection approach, as we talked about, shows, nicely, nicely shows you the, the caustic structures in the inlet there. So. We used that uh, approach to render a second scene for the Dark Universe Planetarium show. Uh, you see a projection of a uh, simulation run by, by Tom and, and Oliver Hahn here at a test screening in the Hayden Planetarium. So for this simulation, we used uh, about 2,300 uh, time steps of uh, 760 something cubed tracer particles that were generated from replicating a 256 cubed input data 27 times to get more structure in the background. So that resulted in like 16 billion triangles per snapshot that had to be generated at 24 megapixels resolution. And using the approach I mentioned before, we were able to do that on a single workstation in a Spotter 4000 card. So uh, here's the scene, and you're gonna hear the gentle voice of Neil deGrasse Tyson in a second. <laughs> Scientists find that dark matter, shown here in black, was essential to forming the large-scale structure of today's universe. This computer simulation traces how cosmic structure evolved over time. The bright knots contain thousands of galaxies, drawn together by the vast sheets and tendrils of dark matter. These knots grew from the densest region seen in the cosmic background radiation. The less dense regions of the background became cosmic voids, big, empty bubbles, hundreds of millions of light years wide. The gravity generated by normal matter is much too weak to create this cosmic web. Dark matter must be doing the job. What is dark matter? I'm afraid you have to buy a ticket to the, to the show to find that out. <laughs> you have to pay entrance for that. <laughs> I'm not allowed to show that. Um, yeah, in the remaining time I have, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, GPU-based direct volume rendering approaches for, for AMR data, for adaptive mass refinement data. So what's direct volume rendering? Um, direct volume rendering is a visualization scheme where you uh, map your input data to absorption emission co coefficients and then compute the final light intensity that enters the image plane. So you basically have to solve the radiation transfer equation for your data domain. And in order to speed up the computation, you usually ignore scattering in this approach. You just sum up the uh, intensities along straight line of sights for each pixel. And for, for AMR, um, this comes with a couple of problems because the uh, AMR data structure is usually just given as a, a long list of these uh, refined boxes. So you have a lot of overlaps in this data structure per default. So one thing you have to do is to use additional data structures to um, make sure you, you have a uh, configuration that is appropriate to render a big graphics card and avoid rendering a refined regions multiple times. So adaptive KD trees, for example, are very handy for doing so. You chop up your data domain into blocks of, of cells from the same resolution level. And the KD tree also has a nice uh, feature that they allow you to tra traverse these blocks in a view consistent order. Um, 
if you have order dependent blending equation uh, required for your uh, lighting model, for example. So in 12 years ago, something, the only way to get good performance out of these cards doing direct volume rendering was uh, what something that's called slice-based direct volume rendering, where you would use the excellent support of these cards for, for filtering and blending operations. So you traverse your KD tree on the CPU, and then uh, once you know, uh, hit a node, or you, you traverse a node, found a node in this tree that was selected for rendering based on the resolution, the screen space resolution, for example, you would upload that node to the, data, to the, to the GPU, and then slice it up using a couple of, of semi-transparent slices and blend them sequentially in the image buffer to build up the uh, overall image and get a yeah, result for the, for the ray integral along the line of sight for each pixel. Um, so here's a little animation we did at that time. Uh, one of Tom's first star simulation for a uh, project um, with the Discovery Channel television show, which we rendered in cooperation with Donna Cox's group at NCSA. So the contours we see here are isocontours and the gas density, and the brighter the color, the higher the gas density. Um, then zooming into the dense region, the central part, and blend over to an even higher resolve simulation that was, I think, 27 refinement levels. It was at that time the record that Matt and, and Tom really drove that limit to 47, or what is the record, 50 levels of refinement? Is it? Okay. Yeah, so we see the shells and, and uh, approach the region where the material that will fall, uh, later on fall onto the protostar star is, is accreted. But this is just a time snapshot here, a snapshot in time from the time dependent simulation. So at that time, quite a lot of operations still had to be done on the CPU. So there, there was the geometry setup, the slices, the traversal of this additional KD tree we needed to avoid multiple renderings, the level of detail selection, all that was done on the CPU. Only the data sampling and the blending was performed on the GPU. And then a couple of la uh, years later, it was feasible to perform the ray integration in fragment shaders on these cards. So you didn't have to do this weird slicing anymore. You could really integrate using numerical methods in, in fragment shaders. So the layout of the algorithm we used at that time was still the same. We would traverse the KD tree on the CPU, and then once a node was selected for rendering, we would render the front faces of these domains, which were uh, would initialize fragment shaders, so one instant for each pixel, and then inside the fragment shader, you could compute the uh, intensity and opacity values for that ray segment, and then combine all the segments together in the frame buffer, display the final uh, rendering result. And here's a couple of examples that were generated using these techniques over the years. So supermassive black hole simulation in the lower left there, or the star simulation by, by John Weiss and Tom at the upper right. It's also possible to combine like this volumetric rendering with, with other rendering primitives like streamlines or, or uh, point-based data sets, which is on the uh, lower right there. Um, it runs in a cluster, so use a little, uh, you have a little GPU cluster at, at Kaipeg, which was kind of outdated, so it has this quite old NVIDIA 68 graphics, 1000, 68,000, um, 6,800 graphics cards. So for this example, we just ran 12 instances of the renderer to feed the input data to the, to the nodes here. Um, but still, like a lot of stuff was done on the CPU. The traversal of the tree was still done on the CPU, the level of detail selection. If you needed access to the whole data domain, you had to do it on the CPU. On the GPU, you would just have access to one block at a time that was rendered. Um, so in the last year, we, we shifted even more of this stuff to the GPU. So now the KD tree is uh, traversed on the GPU, uh, the level of detail selection is done there. We, in principle, have access to the whole domain. Uh, data sampling blending is still done there. So the only stuff the C uh, CPU does is the data I/O. It has to provide the data. The GPU can do that. But everything else is now done on the GPU, and that gives you a lot of flexibility in what you can do. It allows for a lot of advanced shading techniques that, that natively work for uniform data blocks, but for AMR you have a lot of problems because you have to handle these discontinuities at level boundaries for the resolution changes. So a simple example is like, for example, gradient-based shading where you need gradients to, to add some specular highlights, for example, to better work out structures of, of curved surfaces. Um, this can be done on the GPU now. You can now on the fly compute uh, these gradients for AMR data. Otherwise, you would get in earlier versions where you just had one block at a time, you would get problems in evaluating the stance of at the level boundaries because you couldn't gather all the data you needed. And that just worked now. So 
that's a gravitational, a gravitational wave a simulation by William Eve at Taipei, where you just added these, these on the fly gradient shape, uh, shaded surfaces there to, to better work out the structures of these isocontours over time. And I think it helps a lot to, to get an idea of how these uh, surfaces are curved and um, help the, the viewer to, to get an idea of um, what's in the front and what's in the back here. We can also get rid of this assumption of no scattering. So usually you assume you integrate along straight lines of sight. What you can do, do now is like simulate global illumination from central light sources, for example. Here's some snapshots from a simulation by uh, John Wise and, and Tom. About 100,000 subscripts, a billion cells. And I just used one snapshot from that. I, it will later on form a star, but the star you're going to see in a second wasn't computed by Enzo. It was computed in a fragment shader. We're just uh, changing the source field of the fragment shader. And um, computing how the light is propagated through the, through the medium here. So we dialed up the intensity for the central source over time to get an idea of how the light yeah, moves through the domain during this um, uh, shadows that are cast by the denser regions in that domain. There's no hydro involved, it's just a, snap, a static time step, so the denser doesn't move here. The, the, um, and the two regions uh, don't change over time, it just computed the um, transfer of light through the domain here, approximated that in the fragment shader. And uh, then I thought, well, why, why not just move the thing out of the box and see how it illuminates the box from the outside? I mean, sh often shadows help to get an idea of, of, of how the um, structures are distributed. I mean, it's a fake example. You shouldn't show it to your students, for sure. Um, but um, I think it gives you an idea of what you can do now on these cards, because in a pro post-processing step, more or less at near interactive frame, it takes a couple of seconds to generate a new frame for the setup, setup here. And yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to show you. Um, thanks for your attention.